everyone. How's everyone doing? Yo, this is a great audience. I am so excited because I absolutely love the book. I have a lot of questions. So I guess we're going to get started with uh, Amos and Rocco, way down there. How are you? Hi. Hello. What's up, guys? So we are in a world now where there's visibil trans visibility, there's a conversation. But in 2009, what was that like? Explain the landscape. Why did you start OP? Uh, I would. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Cool. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out in the rain. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of people. Um, I don't think there was a ton of visibility. I had transitioned in 2000, mm -hmm. and um, there was nothing, really. And I was performing, and people would interview me. I'd like release an album or do something of note, and they would interview me, and it would be basically questions about, like, where are you at with your medical transition? And then like a footnote that I was doing something artistic. So um, Amos, and that mu m mostly didn't change over the nine years that from 2000 to 2009. And then Amos and I knew each other. He moved back to the Bay. And I was photographing trans guys in the San Francisco area because I wanted to make a little photo zine, like a little one-off that would be color Xerox, and I would interview the guys and staple it. and probably sell it at little bookstores, and that was the initial concept. And when I was talking to Rocco about it, um, he was like, why don't you just make it like bigger and keep doing it? Don't do it just once, and I'll help you. And really, it just grew from there, and it was like an instant connection, and we just couldn't get enough. <laughs> we committed to doing a year, and when it took off, then we were like, let's just keep doing it. And then when it seemed like it was an established thing, um, we decided to commit to doing 20 issues. And it took a long time. It was quarterly, but you know, it took 10 years to get to 20 issues. <laughs> Why print? I've always loved print. Yeah. Like, oh, I've always like <laughs> had a connection with magazines and like, especially like teen magazines and um, fashion magazines also, but like a combination of the two. And I remember always going to magazine stands and looking for some sort of trans magazine that I could see myself Transgender reflected Transgender tapestry. In. Well, yeah, That's what existed. that existed. But I remember being like, is there anything for trans guys? And just not seeing anything ever. And that's what really pushed me to take the aesthetics that I love and At create. At the time, you were like really into butt magazine, too. Yeah, that was so. actually a huge like, uh, visual inspiration for the first, say, like two and a half issues, was me like looking at butt magazine and then like uh, teaching myself, what was that? In design. In design, and like losing, like my eyes were like crossed trying to figure it out for the first couple issues. Um, but I also think that there's something really incredible in a moment where everyone was saying that print is dead, mm -hmm. that that magazine took off like instantaneously before we had even printed the first one, just when we started a Facebook page. And it was also kind of growing in tandem with uh, social media. And social media was the first moment that trans people got to represent themselves and speak for themselves. So I think that that level of visibility kind of shaped, it, OP sort of helped shape, the two things worked in tandem. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that it's it's nice to have this physical project that will live forever mm -hmm. as a physical project instead of just this sort of transient, ephemeral online presence, which was a, another reason that we decided not to uh, put the magazine online okay. digitally. Yeah, it was like really a, a connection to print, okay. the printed media that I've had since I was a kid and never thought that I would want to create a blog. That mm -hmm. wasn't like my intention at okay. first, so it was it felt just... Like a time capsule. Yeah. Right? Okay. Each, did, each, each did issue. Did you have any experience with like a magazine or you were just learning all on the spot? No. no. Just okay. totally self-taught. <laughs> um, just liked to, to consume magazines and like, you know, submit my work to magazines, mm -hmm. but that was really it. Okay. Did I you have a vision? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if either of us had thought ahead of like, what, what does it yeah. mean that we're doing this? Mm -hmm. We both would have been like, fuck, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one's like, you know what's going to make me rich and famous? Making a magazine for trans men. <laughs> <laughs> Out of our bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> did you have Four a, like, times a year. what the vision of the magazine would look like? What you want to say? Like, did you, how we, are we just wanted to trans people to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there had, again, there had been no platform. I was really excited about having this moment of just individuals being able to tell their story and that the trans part was the footnote instead mm -hmm. of their, their lives and their work and who they were being the footnote to their trans experience okay. so that was like the prime motivator for me the motivator for me was to 
document people in the community and uh, same, allow them to speak for themselves, allow, allow them to tell me what kind of photo shoot they wanted, like mm -hmm. their comfort level. Um, in the beginning, we had a lot of shirtlessness and a lot of, you know, some tasteful nudes were involved. Um, less and less as the magazine went on, but it was just a place where I wanted people to feel comfortable and like they had a say in the way that they were being shown on the paper, on, pap on the pages. Yeah. I think it's important to kind of note that the taste, tasteful nudes were really crucial too because trans men in particular had not gotten to see themselves or their bodies as beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly being photographed and then documented by other trans men, so it's always this outside lens that was kind of, at, for me, like mm -hmm. people would want to take my picture and it would be the same kind of classic photo. I don't know if this photo still exists, this type of photo still exists for a cis person being like, now look into the mirror and it touch exists. the mirror. That photo still exists. Look, gaze into your own eyes. Um, so I think we didn't do any of those mirror shots we like that. No, we no, no mirror okay, shots. Okay, no, we didn't do it. That's, yeah, right. that's, that's an good. outside lens yeah. being like, who do you see? The real you. Uh, yeah. Okay. How did the magazine change over the 10 years? I think, well, after the first couple issues, we brought on um, my good friend Derek, who's in the audience, as a designer to help elevate it. And he worked on it until the 20th issue. Congratulations. Thank you, Derek. Derek. He's in the back. He's like the silent partner. He helped elevate the design, and every issue kind of had a different feel to it. Um, and he worked meticulously with us, with every on every mm -hmm. issue, um, and like took our vision into his, you know, everything that he did for it. It took it from like being zine quality yeah. to being like art book quality. Yes, so, yeah, definitely. And beyond that, there was a lot. Uh, I think after the initial excitement came exhaustion. And burnout. We, yes, burnout. And I think that if you're doing a community based project, it's important to figure out how to take care of yourself through it because yeah. though this community is like really beautiful and incredible, um, we can kind of be really vicious to each other. So it's, it's really important to make sure that you figure out how much you can give mm -hmm. and when you feel drained to kind of allow yourself the space to recharge and disconnect from it. And we learned that in. Um, uh, the hard way. Yes, definitely. Definitely experienced burnout. And I feel like it got more serious over time. Like it was less, in, in the beginning I was like, I just wanted it to be like a fun, cheeky teen magazine for trans guys of all, you know, of different ages. But then it became much more serious. I think as we... Or less uh, like, I don't know, well, less Well, we realized flippant. that as it went on, that it was the only thing that existed that was documenting trans men and trans male lives and culture so that we understood the gravity of what mm -hmm. we were producing and the reach that we had, and we took that as a responsibility and less of like this playful kind of right. project that was just us in Amos's or my bedroom mm -hmm. kind of like bouncing ideas off of each other. We knew that we had a reach and we had an obligation to kind of preserve and document this, this history. Yeah. Did you have an idea that uh, each issue has a theme? Did that come early on? Yeah. Immediately. Before I love the a first theme. Issue. Like, I need a theme to, like, <laughs> yeah. figure out whatever, you know, you got to make, make lists mm -hmm. and we made lists, lists and of then, themes. And, and then, then lists of people that themes. would be in the themes. And then we had, like, this, like, uh, butcher paper on his wall that was just, like, mm -hmm. future themes. Like, the hero issue was something that we thought of day one that we were, like, we have to work to that because we want it to be, like, an actual yeah. gift and honor these people that came before us. And there are some themes that we had thought of immediately that mm -hmm. we never got yeah. to. Okay, but what are some of those? Men of the Cloth. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was going to be cool, yeah. We had like cast it in our minds yeah. too. Okay. We had like really <laughs> cast diversely. But it, was very, it was hard. It, but it just didn't. Yeah. Uh, didn't come. Maybe later. Right? Maybe. If someone else wants someone to start a new project, please have that idea. I would love to. Are there any of the issues that you're most proud of of what you've accomplished? I love the hero yeah, issue. The hero mm -hmm. issue. Um, just learning more about the history through creating that issue, and the issue took a very long time to make. That's when it it's we started. It's a double to, issue too. Yes. It's like double the size of other issues. It was bursting at the seams, and remember, it was like we got it back from the printer, and we were like upset because it was literally bursting at the seams, and they should they have warned us it. and told us like yeah. you should use a different paper. 
we learned these things as we went along. But yeah. the hero issue was awesome, and then I loved the entertainment issue because it was so fun to photograph everybody in it. And then the family, the family issue. issue was yeah, fun. Yeah, that was sweet. Because our moms are in it. Yeah. The hero issue was really cool because um, I had like hero worshipped Jameson Green for a long time, mm -hmm. and getting to interview him in that way was this beautiful thing that happened for me because now he's a mentor to me and I have this personal relationship with him and he was in 2004 his book came out and it was the first time I had ever read about a trans man's experience so it was really crucial to for me because mm -hmm. there was nothing when I transitioned yeah. in like 2000 there was nothing that existed except Lauren Cameron's book that came out in the late 90s I think mm -hmm. body alchemy and then later like 2000 between 2001 maybe 2002 a book called the phallus palace by Dean Catula mm -hmm. anything else Oh, but hadn't transitioned yet. Maxwell Valerio. Yeah, there yeah, was, uh, that was way later though. Files. That came oh, out way later. Okay. I'm just thinking like early 2000s. There was nothing. Okay. So it was cool to kind of get to go back, and then we also got to reprint all these old uh, FTM I newsletters mm -hmm. that existed. So that's cool. That issue, we still have copies left. We sure do. In my mother's Check basement. Check them out on the website. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I forget which issue in the editor's letter you talk about this was going to be uh, by trans males for trans males. But at some point you open it up to that. What was the decision behind that? Well, I think in some issues we had, like for the hero issue, we included Janet Mock and uh, Kate Bornstein. And mm -hmm. we were thinking of it in ways where it's not, we can interview and honor trans women as well who have you know paved the way and, and inspired all trans people mm -hmm. and we have partners early on like entranced remember that section with oh greg and chris yeah i think that was issue two yeah that three the, i think he was in the they were the couple was in the first issue but then we had the yeah. other junior and tina tina what that was the family issue or the fourth mm -hmm. yeah hey. Issue. So I guess, like, what do you think uh, your contribution was to print, to trans communities? I think we created and kind of launched this. Now I'm almost 40 mm -hmm. and um, less shy about understanding that I had some sort of impact with this project. Mm -hmm. uh, like, if you had asked me five years ago, I would have been like, oh, nothing. Uh -huh. <laughs> but now it's like to have this, like, lens that's pulled back, I'm like, Whoa, that was a movement. Mm -hmm. It really created a movement. I think Scout threw a party for us not long after, and which he can speak to, but seeing the physical manifestation of that space, mm -hmm. and this whole project was funded by a party that someone else threw for us in San Francisco okay. before the magazine got printed, so then we were able to afford to print it. Mm -hmm. But guys drove all the way from like Stockton, California, to San Francisco to come, and it was this moment where you're like, oh wow, everyone is hungry for this project. Mm -hmm. Our PayPal, uh, account got shut down because they thought we were like doing fraudulent activity when we printed yeah. the first issue um, because sales were coming in so quickly. So I think that it was really like we, OP sort of was at the very inception of this trans media mm -hmm. explosion that happened. Mm -hmm. So those first couple of years, it was like, it was as if we had a PR agent working for us. But mm -hmm. meanwhile, we were like taking trash bags to the post office and like, stamping each thing individually and mm -hmm. handwriting each address because we were fumbling and kind of feebly. We're not business people. Right. <laughs> we couldn't even figure out like how to yeah, do some very simple things that everyone would make fun of us. Like a stamp machine? Yes. And the, and I bought the stamp machine, but I didn't. Didn't I, work, though. I, it was wasteful. Yeah. <laughs> the, there were certain post offices that people would see us come in, and they were like, oh, god. <laughs> there was one woman here. We lived together when we were living here, and we, when we went with our big, giant blue IKEA bags, she was like, why do you do this to me? Why? I need to go on a lunch break. So we did our best. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about the wonderful book. Why the decision to put everything in the book? Why are you ending it? Talk about those well, things. Well, we promised 20 issues okay. to ourselves, and also, like, I think that it's more than I ever wanted it to be. I didn't really think what it would be, mm -hmm. actually. So, I think, oops, at first, um, after the first issue came out, I always thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could have it be published into a book if it had a long run? And it was my dream to have some sort of coffee table book. and. 
that was something that I think we were working towards in the back of our minds, or that was always an idea and like a consideration. It was on that list. We made yeah, a list like at our, the beginning. Our list of like goals mm-hmm. of like have it be a book eventually. I just, oops. Um, <coughs> yeah, why not have it be a book? Yeah. <laughs> That's like and then feminist the press best way came to along it. and we were like, oh, incredible. Yeah. Thanks, Feminist Press. But I think that 20 issues is good. 10 years, 20 issues is like, if somebody, we are, you know. That's nice. That was longer than I think either of us expected. Mm. That it would take 10 years? Or that we would be doing this for 10 years? For 10 years. Yeah, well, like I said, we wouldn't have committed to 10 years. Mm -hmm. We committed to one year. Look at what happened. Do you feel like there's anything that you still want to say or you said everything that you needed to? With with this project or in general? with the project. (laughs) Yes and yes. <laughs> I think this project did its job. Um, it was yeah. 10 years, a nice time capsule. I'm hoping that this book is an, a way that will reignite people's interest in trans male culture, uh, at least these 10 years. I think that though it was spanning a particular time, that it will stand the test of time and that maybe it will serve to be one of those kind of touchstone books like I mentioned, like Body Alchemy, where mm-hmm. I have a tattered copy that I've had since the beginning of my transition. Okay. I'm hoping that this book does that for a new generation. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that, like, yeah, because I don't know if, like, the younger trans guys get off Instagram to kind of see themselves mm-hmm. and read more than just the comment section. But I'm hopeful that they do, yeah. and that this will outlast any sort of ephemeral moment of visibility. Okay. Yeah. And I guess we have three of the contributors here. And I guess, like, talk about your contribution and your connection to OP. Sure. Um, so when I was introduced to uh, Rocco and Amos, I was living in Boston at the time, um, and I was DJing a lot, a lot. Um, and we just kind of bonded. I, You reminded me where we even met, this place called Spontaneous Celebrations. I don't even know if it's still there. But um, it, I don't know. We just um, had a connection, and I knew that... Um, because there was so much attention and need for physical space and in addition to the, everything you were doing and producing had a physical aspect to it, right? Like take yourself offline, live your life in, in the real world. And um, you know, I think with the parties um, that were started, I started, when you all were coming to Boston, I threw a party and threw another one, maybe two or three. Um, and that's kind of how I got involved with the magazine. Um, I uh, was also in the party issue um, at some point, uh, mid-run, I guess. Um, but yeah, we um, threw parties and um, we booked like Mickey Blanco and um, a bunch of like local, um, um, DJs and just it was so much fun and people were just really looking forward to um, connecting with people, making friends, traveling from similarly like you know tri-state area or whatever to come and um, just be a part of that space and kind of connect with people. So it was really special to um, be able to work with you all in that capacity and to um, you know contribute in any way possible to um, this because for me um, the magazine really affected me like in a positive way because for me I was you know was very hungry for you know what you're talking about like a uh, I wanted to see myself um, in ways that weren't reflected in a way that you know was like hot and sexy and fun and irreverent and also taken seriously right like all of the things that we were kind of talking about and um, I was very thankful to have um, an opportunity to kind of contribute it but also to um, have access to that kind of um, you know, documentation, and um, it was really life-changing because, you know, I think when your album kind of came out and, you know, all of that other stuff, um, it's kind of like the first time you meet a trans guy and you don't know you're trans yet, and you're like, who's this person? Why do you feel so familiar? And, like, it doesn't make sense until you you kind of start putting the pieces together, and that's how I felt about um, the, the zine and the magazine and everything that was kind of created out of that. So for me, it was, you know, very special to be able to participate. Right. Hello, um, my name is Scout, and I um, just want to say thank you, everyone, for coming out, and thank you, um, Rocco and Amos, for having me speak. Um, I found out about the project through a couple of friends before it actually was ever published, and at the time, I was working at a gay nightclub in Williamsburg called Sugarland, rest in peace, um, and was throwing a party there as well called Hey Queen, a monthly party, and 
when when my colleague told me about this magazine, um, I think we, we, we both, he was also a trans man, he was managing a sister bar, um, Metropolitan, which is still around. We were like, we should do something, right? Like, Hey Queen was super fun, but also just we were really hungry for spaces where trans masculine folks could, like it was specifically for trans masculine folks, like a celebration of ourselves and nothing at the time really existed. When I first moved to New York, there was a party called Manhunt um, that happened at the Boiler Room. And it, it went, went on for a few years, and, but then it went away. And I don't remember that one. Um, I think there was, just, there was just an obvious vacuum, and so I reached out to them and asked them if they would be interested in having a New York release party. And three months later, uh, Amos came to New York, and we had the first party, and the response was like nothing we had ever imagined. That's a, hey Queen had been a very successful party, and I think we were getting about 350 people a night, and that felt amazing. Um, the first original plum plumbing had 600 attendees, over 600 attendees. There were so many people trying to pack themselves inside of Sugarland that there was a huge crowd outside as well, which attracted the attention of New York City's um, Vice Squad. And they, they came in, sort of looked around, and then walked out. Um, and I think we were all just shell shocked. We were just like, wow. I mean, it, it, like it, trans guys came out of the woodwork, and it was just really beautiful to see everybody sweaty and dancing, and you know, it was really special. Um, I, think, I think I stuck around for like three or four more parties, and then passed the hat. But it was it was an amazing time. It was really beautiful, and also just a really necessary thing for the community in that moment. Great. It actually led to us moving to New York. Oh, well, well, you're the reason. <laughs> hey, I'm Harvey. Um, so I've known these folks for a long time. I can't remember where we first met. In New York Homo somewhere. Homo Go-Go. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah, okay. I don't know what year, though. I don't know. Okay. You were photographing. There it is. Um, and Rocco and I traveled together uh, performing um, for about 10 years. So I, we sat like this. Usually drove, I think. So, I, yeah, I'm in the passenger seat. Um, so um, I was living in a small city in Georgia for uh, about 12 years. And I think that what I, what I really appreciate about the original uh, plumbing project is that, you know, like not a, the, the river kind of ends pretty quickly after you get out of the big cities where the information flow goes. And, you know, when you are in, a, in these small cities or in, in non-coastal areas, you don't have much access to, to trans people, trans culture, trans media. Um, you don't know what, you don't know the words to use. I really found myself about 10 years behind everybody else on, on proper terminology and, and stuff like that. So I really appreciate the project for the reach it has um, beyond the big cities and, and how it was able to impact lives. It is a very lonely life. Uh, the first time I met another trans person, I literally walked into a door because I was and I smacked myself in the face. So it was like really nice to, to, to see a project that had such you know far reach that you get in this very analog manner that like you get in the mail, like just like you know, that's available to everybody. It was really that was really awesome. I am curious, how do you feel about trans metal exposure now, and how would you like to see it move forward? Oh no, I mean, in anyone, everyone. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk. I mean, I think it's cool that there's like trans guys playing trans roles on television and film right now. Um, of course, there needs to be more roles written. Uh, I just, that's a positive. You, know, you want me to give the negatives? Yeah, you can do the negatives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're a bad cop. I, uh, well, you know, I'm born and raised in the Bay, but I was raised by a New Yorker, so I don't have a filter either. Um, I think that. I don't see a ton of representation for trans men um, or trans masculine folks in general. I think that there is this like kind of media blitz around trans people and there's this uh, new or kind of ignited curiosity for trans people, particularly trans feminine or trans, trans feminine people or trans women. But I don't, I still don't see a ton of, it feels the same to yeah. me in most ways. And I would say even what's interesting is 10 years ago, when we put this magazine out, there was this new 
curiosity where people were like, what's this? A new gender? You know, like, so it was like a lot of people discovering that trans men existed for the first time. So it was easier for us to get press. And now, after 10 years, I feel like those first two years, we got a ton of press. And with the 10 year mark and the culmination of this project being a book, um, even it was hard for us to even kind of get uh, like a modicum of the press that we got for the first two years. And I don't think that that's like because the book isn't deserving of mm-hmm. recognition or attention. I just think that there's less curiosity okay. about trans men. I don't know. I feel like anybody can speak on that. We're all observing from the sidelines mm-hmm. and watching that there's not a ton of representation okay. for trans men. And I don't mean self-representation on social media because mm-hmm. there is a ton of that. But even that is the discoverability of it is if you're a white, hard-bodied, mm-hmm. kind of normative, cis-presenting okay. trans man, mm-hmm. then you're going to be posting before and after pictures in this almost sort of like Jerry Springer way, yeah. in my opinion, because that was, that was the vision. When I, was, when I began my transition, I was like watching Maury Povich and mm-hmm. discovered that I was a thing. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So it took watching this horrific kind of circus freak show to, for me sitting in my parents' house being like, oh my God, that's me. Yeah. You know? And now we're kind of going back to that of posting these before and mm-hmm. after and or in a powerful reclamation kind of way. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't think there's a ton of, of media outlets giving okay. voice to trans male experience. Yeah, I agree with that. That there's, I can't remember who I was talking to about the lack of overall uh, trans masculine celebrity. Like there is no one or two. Like, you know, we can point to like Janet Mogg or like um, Laverne Cox or or Caitlyn Jenner, right? Or um, I'm, why am Laverne I Cox. Laverne Cox? Thank you. Yeah, like you know, right? It's like super, you know, famous folks that, uh, but not for trans masculine people, which I find really fascinating. But I think, for me, my the reason why I think this, and this is maybe my, I don't know, my observation. I'll say this is that um, when you when you think about people's imagination and how media portrays trans people, I think you only, if you're coming from like an outside perspective and you don't know anything about trans people, Mm -hmm. you probably only think of trans women and or you don't know anything about gender, period. Mm -hmm. So you have, you're conflating everything. You have no idea what you're talking about or thinking about. And I see this play out like in my day-to-day work. Like I work in queer public health and I do trans specific Mm -hmm. work. Um, And when you look at how funding is run, for instance, for a lot of uh, programming, um, it's all run through like HIV funding, which is all mostly like kind of specific to um, gay cis men. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when you look at the, uh, the programming that's funded through that or through any kind of public health lens, and if it's like trans specific, it's really kind of talking about trans women only. Mm-hmm. There's no focus at all on, on trans masculine people's needs. Um, so, you know, I think like when you consider everything together, like how social media works, how regular kind of uh, mainstream media works, how funding in any capacity for this kind of work is. And um, when you think about kind of LGBT communities and and everything, everything is really kind of through public health anyway because of um, the legacy of HIV in the community and everything. So there's a lot of limited, uh, you know, I think ideas about who trans people are, Mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, trans masculine people exist. Um, There's also, I think, um, kind of this false narrative that <clears throat> trans men don't have problems or issues, um, and it's not that that's not the case, right? So I think that there's just um, um, a l- I don't think people really understand trans men, and uh, and I think that's a problem is that we tend to disappear into the fabric, and so we don't exist for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think. <clears throat> And maybe this is just a general trend. It's definitely just a general trend in the world. But I feel like a lot of transmasculine culture today happens in the digital space and the digital space alone, right? So you have YouTube or bloggers, um, not very many, but our Instagram representation. Um, and I think that beca- that as a result, only certain types of... There's only certain types of representation, right? That, like, what what gets... 
put forward in the algorithm on YouTube or on Instagram or what what gets the most likes. Um, and then I think there's a, a really lack there's a lack of like a physical space where people can meet trans men or trans men can meet each other and potentially see um, images of themselves that aren't those images that they're seeing on Instagram, for example. Um, yeah, it seems like uh, we've, there's a, a huge disconnect, right? With, with OP even just having the physical magazine, it's something about it feels different. Um, you, it's not subject to a, you know some sort of massive corporation's algorithm. And then the accompanying party is like a physical space where trans masculine folks can meet each other and see each other in person, connect and et cetera. For Amos and Rock, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I was trying to think through this, and I, I was like, oh, actually, like, I don't remember seeing any sort of media on trans guys, like, can't, like, I'm, I'm trying to think through it, and I was trying to think why, and I think as, um, uh, like, the world became more ready to hear uh, trans voices and, and queer voices as well, we sort of got this idea that, um, I'm trying to think, think through this as I speak, like, I think we are, everybody was like, thinking there's a scarcity of space, like there's, there's got not, enough, not enough room for everybody to speak, so uh, give the platform for maybe like the, I don't know, the, the folks who have been like most hurt by the world um, or who need the space the most. And I think um, trans voices maybe stayed quiet through that, that time and now I don't know. There isn't actually no scarcity of space, you know, like mm -hmm. of, of media options and uh, and platforms. I don't know. I'm thinking through it as I go, y'all. Yeah, it's sort of like what what Dahana and Harvey was just about to touch on. Um, this sort of erasure of trans men is really complicated and and sad because trans men are. Uh, I think the on some level maybe in our personal lives or in a larger kind of community forum or discussion online in real life, there's this um, narrative that now you have privilege, please be quiet and make yourself small. And I think that trans men are like, oh, absolutely, and then sort of back away from it. I'm also gonna say this indelicately, so pardon me, because I'm, I'm just working through it as well. But. Um, but as a result, we as a community and then the larger world miss out on this opportunity of, uh, you know, trans men were not, we have not embodied a lifetime of male privilege. We've all been really, ideally, we've had the opportunity to be really intentional about how we are men and how we take up space. And, uh, you know, we also have the opportunity to have feminism inform the way that we are male and take up space. And when we ask, trans men to be quiet consistently, we're losing the opportunity to allow trans men to expand on what it means to be a man and to help inform cis men on how they might be more intentional about their maleness and to be in a conversation with the larger community, but also just to, to be in conversation with men, all men. Um, ha allowing trans men to have a seat at that table okay. to kind of shift what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because masculinity works in very specific ways, and it doesn't really deviate very much. Like, you know what it is when you see it. And I think, um, you know, how do I say this? When, uh, so masculinity is the dominant, it's dominant, right? So um, I think that's why we are not seen, right? Because uh, when you're growing up and you're a tomboy, at least for me, like I grew up in a very religious household, and um, but yet my parents allowed me to kind of be a tomboy when I was a kid, but when I didn't grow out of that, that's when kind of the trouble began with my family. Um, but because that's okay, like when I was a kid and as a, as a young girl, being a tomboy was kind of cute or fine, you know? Um, and that's not the case for uh, someone who might be assigned male at birth, and if you're like a feminine, then you're gonna have a really difficult time your entire life, right? So um, that's just, I think a lot of what makes it so kind of complex and really gray is that people's ideas around gender uh, is so specific and stuck and, um, 
immovable, right? So I think that we all kind of get stuck in these traps of how we kind of present ourselves mm -hmm. and how we feel that we might be limited. On, and, you know, and certainly, like, I think if we are, I agree that, like, if we are informed by feminism and or, you know, being uh, socialized as women, you are also then socialized not to take up space and give more, you know, um, space to other folks and uh, be in that kind of um, relationship to other people and other spaces. So it becomes very difficult, I think, to kind of be present in the world, if that makes sense. How do you think that trans men could move through that space of taking more control of their space? I think, I'll say personally for me, uh, after 20 years of being uh, identified as, no, after 20 years of being a man in the world, recognized as a man, understood to be a man, I think that hearing in different iterations, I've heard the request to be quiet or take up less space in the queer community. So now I've kind of shifted my focus. I started these camps for trans men. It's called uh, Camp Lost Boys. If anyone wants a summer camp experience, it will literally change your life. Um, right? Yes. Right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> totally. Um, but I think that. Uh, from that, I realized, like, it was the first time I realized, like, oh, wow, I have a ton of man-hating to unpack, too. And that man-hating has interrupted my ability to authentically love myself mm -hmm. as a man and connect with other men as a man and to love and appreciate men. And I am, like, a rabid man-hater my entire life. Mm -hmm. I read the Scum Manifesto when I was 14. I memorized it. If you don't know what that is, it's Society for Cutting Up Men. It's, like, a crazy rant about how men are garbage, basically. And I, I believed all all of that and then this camp shifted it because I was like I love all of these men who are at this camp as men mm. what 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 has been stopping me and I think it was just permission to see that men are men can be beautiful men can be challenging and men can work through those challenges and come out the other side and men can be vulnerable and tender with each other and then I thought oh well what what's the next step for me and it's nice that it's like OP is kind of closing and as as I move in my own identity I'm just joining the larger space of men in the world, cis or otherwise, and having conversations with men. I'm going to men's groups, I'm engaging with other men about maleness and taking my voice to those rooms because I, I don't wanna just keep saying like, mm -hmm. oh, what can I do? I can take my voice into those spaces and help shape how men are connecting mm -hmm. with each other. I don't know what that looks like larger because it's mm -hmm. just the beginning, but okay. stay tuned. <laughs> So I guess wrapping up, did you have an idea of what your journey would be? Like, did you think like once I transition, I'm good? Like everything would be solved or like that was the main problem? Oh, I never thought I'd be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never thought, period. I never thought I'd be an adult. <laughs> I, yeah, I think most queer people don't imagine a future, especially if they can't see Definitely it. Definitely not. It's right. like walking around in a fog, you know, at yeah. best. Yeah. Oh, I'll make it to 18. Oh, maybe I'll make it to 21. But I think, you know, though I'm done transitioning in terms mm -hmm. of my medical transition, um, I hope I never stop transitioning as a person. Yeah. Great. So we are going to open it up to the audience. Where is the beer? If you'd like to raise your hand, I can run the mic to you. I guess a question to start us off is, how do you manage to put so much swag into the ma magazine on the whole? Derek. Derek. <laughs> Derek Moore is the designer. Um, I think just like, creating a ton of photography, photo moments, and also having so many different contributors. Like, it was a collaborative effort on many levels. It was like everyone who was involved and willing to be photographed or participate in some way. And Everyone's even the ads cute. in the beginning, in the few, like in the early issues, even the advertisements were like very interesting and diverse and told their own story. Because it was always, a lot of them were San Francisco local, like bars, doctors, therapists, um, people having events for their own like fundraisers and things like that. Tool shed from the first issue yep. to the last issue. Yeah, Every the tool shed, issue. which is a store in Minneapolis. <laughs> it's Every a single issue, twenty issues. Derek, do you know? <laughs> Um, who are some of your 
skins of like masculinity that you maybe saw as kids that kind of gave you like you know queer root like beacons and you're like oh that person that that like sparks something in me. For me, Pee Wee Herman was like a huge, huge inspiration as a kid. Like seeing him on television every week, every Saturday for Pee Wee's Playhouse, but also the film, like Pee Wee's Big Adventure, like watching that as like a very, very, very young child and just being obsessed and being like, who is this, this person? Like, I've never seen like a, you know, a, a male human like this before. I didn't know what I thought, he, you know, I really didn't know what gender Pee Wee was, but I liked it. And, yeah, it was a huge moment for me. And then I like I think like a lot of other films growing up as a kid like Stand By Me, the the relationship between the four boys in that film was something that I memorized that film when I was like 7 and just like thinking just the the dialogue um repeating it in my head when I was trying to go to sleep, which is a very strange thing to remember, but something about the relationship between the three boys spoke to me and always like sticks with me, the four d very different backgrounds of these kids. I think I fantasize about that kind of boyhood relationship and connection, too, with Stand By Me. Um, this is half embarrassing. Uh, Tom Cruise from Top Gun. Yeah. And uh, that was a movie that I memorized and like would play out uh, in the summer. Still play volleyball like that. And then uh, John Cusack in Say Anything. Also, a movie I memorized. I was MacGyver all the way. <laughs> the mullet, the duct tape, I was in it. <laughs> I wanted to be him. I just thought, so capable. <laughs> that was, that Harvey me. is totally MacGyver, too. <laughs> After traveling together, he, he would refuse to let go of this one car that he had. It caught fire. It, like, several breakdowns. Oh, the brakes stopped working yeah. while we were driving at 65 on a windy road. And he's that just, like, cool, calm, collected. He's like, all right, we're going to pull the brake really slowly. And I'm going to use this piece of tape to wire this <laughs> thing back together. Like, just didn't, yeah. Oh, man, that guy's awesome. <laughs> Um, I think in hindsight, I wanted to be John Travolta from Greece, um, but I just I actually remembered when we were talking about um, those like er, super early trans like re like representatives of like trans masculine. Um, we totally forgot about Leslie Feinberg mm -hmm. and Stone Butch Blues was a total beacon for me when I was in college. Um, may they rest in power. Um, I had all this time to think about it, and I still don't have... <laughs> I don't have a specific person. I really don't. I think that there were just certain aesthetics, generally speaking, that I really uh, connected with, and I wanted to see that on myself and tried to find that, right? So, like... Um, yeah, I think for me, my early aesthetics came from like wanting to skateboard and like learn, just being like, like doing that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think skaters, if the, <laughs> that's probably the most accurate. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm. Well, we have some time if you guys just want to chat. Did you have an idea of what masculinity was or what you wanted to be, your definition of masculinity? Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> Again, I'm just going to go back to that. I feel like, for me, I was like very connected with what I saw as gayness, gay male um, relationships and experiences. Um, that was what made me feel most authentically male, I think, is when I was um, in a you know, f dating men as a man, that to me was like the pinnacle when I really understood and like felt like who I was in terms of like masculinity, even though that's, yeah, and that's a good, that's my answer. I think my maleness was largely informed by like strong butch women. Uh, yeah, I, my uh, family is does not have like a, the men are not super masculine, um, and I had this. I really wanted to out masculine them, and I think at one point I <laughs> confirmed with my brother that I was the most masculine person in our family, and that was like that was good. That was a good moment. That was a good moment for me. But How old I, were you? Uh, I was about the I think about twenty six, twenty seven, and I say like I was five when I hit the peak. 
But I actually, I felt like, um, does anybody remember Natty Gann? Journey of Natty Gann? It was like, I don't know, it was a Disney situation. She rode the rails as a young child, eating cans of beans. Um, I feel like uh, she was like my personal hero when I was a little kid. And there was like something about, you know, everybody thought she was a boy. She had a wolf. It was super cool. Um, I don't know if it stands the test of time. I haven't revisited it. But um, there was something that I I felt very connected to her. And I I think it was like a very, I feel like I I found uh, like a connection with masculinity like through her. Thank you, Natty. Gan, in your journey. I'm totally blanking. I, um, I mean, I feel like my my journey with masculinity has been all over the place, and I'm not sure I could point at any particular reference. It's, I, when I first started transitioning, I was like very swishy and wearing sparkly belts and painting my nails and um, and just loving that that exploring that like my femininity from like a you know from this like masculine space like as someone who is being read as a male in, per, in by the general public um and then i think i finally settled into this like um like boring dude phase <laughs> for for like a, for a really long time i amos and i've had this conversation before right like yeah when i interviewed you for something for candy for candy yeah for and candy you, magazine you said that you called yourself a boring dude yeah i, I like really like identified as boring for a long time <laughs> Are are you out of that? I, you know, I think I just identify as like an old man now. <laughs> I'm just entering into boring man for the past couple years. Oh. I'm into it. I was totally into it. Uh, so like Josh Hartnett was like my like my my go to. I, I did not go that far. <laughs> <laughs> no shame though. No shame. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, my relationship to masculinity is a little strange. I think I present differently than I feel inside, which is a weird uh, juxtaposition to exist in. Um, I think, depending on the circumstances, I, okay, I'll put it this way. I, I was asking some friends what they thought of me when, like, just looking at me, like, what do you think? And they're like, oh, a straight guy. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, what do you mean? Like, that's not, you know? And I, that made me really uncomfortable. It still makes me uncomfortable. I, um, you know, and I've never internally kind of was like, oh yeah, I'm a man. Like, that never really happened for me. Um, but I have a beard, so here we are. I don't know, and then I had to change my IDs. That's kind of my experience is like, I'm trying to align myself, like my, internal self not so much it's external but for me it's like uh, there's an internal quality to it that's a little bit more important I would say than um, how I present to the world if that I don't know yeah Um, I think because of it was upsetting to me because um, I think maybe Rocco you were talking about being like a man hater like I'm not a man hater I, I don't hate men at all in fact but I don't want to be in that camp in inconvenient times. <laughs> so that's very selfish, I guess, and you can't really pick and choose, but I think that there's like so much there it, it, there's there's so much problematic energy and then and, and, you know uh, things that are happening and especially when things are being revealed right now with uh, everything that's been coming out through like me too and like just it's like there's so much disgusting shit going on that it's like I don't want to be seen or associated so for me it's just I struggle with that um, but I think that's where you kind of take the responsibility to kind of redefine masculinity for yourself and then live that out I guess Uh, so you mentioned earlier that um, you felt, you know, you, you made a couple of like generalizations about feeling, um, you know, trans trans men are, are um, invisible and not given enough uh, space. Can do you have any like personal, I guess, stories or experiences where you feel like your experience uh, of being trans was dismissed in light of other people's experiences, or just kind of in the queer world or outside world? I mean, I think that there, 
is a tendency to have this kind of oppression Olympics. I don't know if you're all familiar with that term where, you know, we're all kind of wanting to one up each other in our oppression. And that's a social media internet thing, I think, specifically. Um, and it's not to, uh, it's not really anybody's fault. I think it's just kind of where we are. And I think that, um, you know, if you're someone who politically, you know, sp spiritually, whatever those things are for you, where you're like, I want to give people space where they need it, where people are most marginalized, then you're going to give it. Um, but that means that you kind of end up giving that all the time, and you're always giving space to other people all of the time, and that makes it easy to kind of disappear from yourself and other people. So um, I think it's turned into a thing where, uh, I think it's common for people to think that trans men don't have as much, as many issues or um, hardships as you know trans feminine people or trans women. Um, I actually do tend to agree with that. I, I'll say that because of the work that I do every day. I've been working with trans people directly for years now, and I've worked with thousands at this point. And so I, I can say that that's true. But that doesn't mean that trans masculine people don't have issues or problems or don't require space to kind of relax and be yourself. And I think that what ends up happening is that we right now are kind of favoring one voice over another and it's not a thing that anyone's really doing on purpose. It's, I don't think it's like purposeful, I think it's just kind of like what's happening and we're just, I think it's hard to figure out where to insert yourself or if you even should insert yourself because when you do, it can become a problematic. Like I think for me, how I've managed to kind of stay out of um, the way is to say absolutely nothing and just kind of speak for myself only and I don't speak for communities or like a larger group of people because it can be, first of all, that's a really big burden to take on for yourself and then once you decide to do that, then you're doing it and then people heap all that shit on you and there's a lot of expectations I think put on people who end up having, uh, becoming kind of elevated to a voice or being represented, represented, uh, represented for like a larger group of people and it's not just trans people, it's like everyone that ends up kind of being elevated, you end up taking that burden on. So it's just kind of where we find ourselves. I have no idea. No. I mean, it's super interesting. I feel like we we like what, it, early on in in um, my transition, people really didn't know that trans guys existed at all. And I was working at a homeless shelter for LGBT youth. Um, trans women of color were like wildly overrepresented in that population for all the reasons that we know. Um, but with another, uh, one of the employees, a, a trans woman I started, we co-started a support group for the trans folks there. And um, I think it was, we were like in the third meeting where, um, um, you know, they, they all started, basically had told me that I, in this group, they were looking at me like, oh, she, you know, she would be cute if she just, like, maybe she could, like, wear this wig. I got a wig. I could, ma I could make her look real cute. Like, people were thinking of me as a trans woman in this space, um, even though I had been talking about my experience as a trans person with these folks. So we went from there to this other space, like, re relatively quickly, where, like, if you Google, search, Google image search transgender, um, you have to get to like the third or fourth page to see a trans masculine person. I don't know if that's still the case, but I, I had done that experiment like maybe six months ago. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I feel like obviously, you know, it's complicated, it's incredibly complicated because trans women of color face more violence, I mean, disproportionately more violence than like any other sector of the population. Um, and, and also, I, you know, you do want to acknowledge like your male privilege and the fact that in all sorts of situations, um, people will listen to, but in like a work environment, for example, people are more apt to listen to my voice than, um, you know, to a trans woman's voice. Um, so I, it's, it's complicated. Um, and I don't know if there's like anything necessarily that, um, I mean, I, I like what you were saying about sort of transitioning your focus from how how can I make myself known within this this like larger LGBT community and what Im to to what impact can I have in the world at large, especially specifically with with men and masculinity? Um, I think it's a it's a really powerful sort of it's like a dynamic switch or thought switch. Um, yeah. If I think like we all have voices and lives that are important, but if our voices and, and experiences aren't what's needed for this movement right now, then let's create 
space in another movement to, to use our voices, the access to emotional uh, emotionality or the access to like the specific path to maleness that we experienced. Let's use that information to change a different community or landscape is where I'm at right now. That could change like tomorrow, but that's where I'm at right now. And I think in part it's sort of like, I mean, I wish there was more space for trans men, but everything you guys said is is 100% right. And I think that you did such a delicate job of crystallizing all this because it was <laughs> here and I wouldn't have done that. So no problem. Yeah. yeah. So, so precisely and eloquently. Um, because it's a challenge. It's a challenge for both of the reasons that, or for the reasons that both of you kind of outlined. And I would love to hear from the audience if they kind of see if anyone else wants to speak to that, like a kind of um, an imbalance of representation. And I don't know. I know that's a lot to put on an audience, but it's a lot to put on a panelist too. A panelist too, because sim similar to what you said, sort of like in back to what you asked of like why is the project ending? In part for me, like I exited being uh, any type of voice. I used to perform. I did this project, and then I just was like, I I'm kind of done because of why you outlined. People ask you to be quiet in different ways that feels like very undoing in in after years of it, very undoing in this way that's like, I I, I mean though I. Again, comparing struggles is really not useful because I've had struggle and trauma unlike a cis person. I've had the experience of being a trans person. And though I, I can pass and walk safely in the world, I still have this history of being trans that lives inside of me. So when I sit in a room full of cis people, I'm, I feel other. Whether or not they see me as other, I feel and understand myself as other and am uncomfortable. And so maybe that's part of the journey of like joining cis men is to stop feeling uncomfortable too after 20 years of transitioning and kind of what you said too of like, I always sort of wanted to distance myself from men in this way that I was like, I'm a man, but not like that. And now I feel like, well, what does that mean if I own that and I am a man, period? Like, what does that mean? And how can that change if me and all these other trans men or men of trans experience or intentional men join this kind of conversation? How does that shift everything? And right now, especially with it, in the era of Me Too, like how do we use our voices and this information to completely flip how men behave? And I think that that's the power that trans men have that we haven't recognized as a community yet, that we can see that our voices can be used for so much more than just being silent in the larger like queer community.